God wants you to be happy the right way. Happiness comes from holiness. There is no happiness apart from holiness. Yes, temporal happiness may be, but real happiness only when you live a life pleasing to God. So what's the topic today? Be grateful for God's sovereign grace. I want to highlight three important truths. God's sovereign grace involves God's election. The word election, you all know, you choose. That's the word for election. God chooses, but how does he choose? Number two, it's about God's wisdom. God's sovereign grace has everything to do with this wisdom. That's why I am so grateful. I am so grateful that God has chosen us. I am so grateful that God is all wise in what's happening to my life and your life. And I'm so grateful. You know why? God's kindness and severity. You see, God is not just a God that is full of emotions. God is righteous. And that's why you need to understand what do we mean by God's kindness and God's severity. It is a great comfort. And I am grateful that our God is kind. At the same time, our God can also be a disciplinarian. He will judge. Let's begin. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. I say then, has, God has not rejected his people, has he? In other words, is Israel gone forever? You have to understand. When Paul was writing this, what was happening? The Jewish people ceases to be a nation. They were already conquered by the Romans. They don't even own Jerusalem. So, conclusion, is Israel gone do you know today there are many theologians who believe in replacement theology? It's a very dangerous theology. It was developed hundreds of years ago. The reason is they say Israel is no longer the promised choice people of God because they committed tremendous sin, they crucified Jesus, and therefore they are wiped off the map. There's no more nation called Israel. And they were correct for 2,000 years. But what do you know? In 1948, Israel became a nation. So that replacement theology is debunked by history. The church is not going to take the place of Israel. Israel and the church are different, but both are blessed. Both are chosen. Let me explain to you. May it never be, for I too am an Israel, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage of, about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Paul now uses two examples to prove to us God has not rejected Israel. Out of God's sovereign grace, Paul is saying, look at me. Paul is saying, I am a Jew. I am a tribe of Benjamin. I am a Jew and God saved me. So God has not rejected the Jewish people. All the early disciples were Jews. So God has not rejected his people, but it is by choice, by election. And then he uses Elijah as an example. Why? Guys, if you study church history and Jewish history, it was the, the height of paganism in the time of Elijah. King Ahab institutionalized the worship of Baal. The whole state of Israel decided to go pagan. They began to support through state tax money to support the pagan prophets. And they began to destroy the altar in Israel. In other words, this is the lowest point in the history of Israel when it comes to the idea of religious purity. Can you imagine the king, his cabinet members, are all worshippers of idols? Elijah, just like many Christians, he knows how to be dramatic. You know drama? The Lord, they have killed your prophets, which is true. They have torn down your altars, which is true. In his mind, I alone am left in his mind, but that's not true. And they are seeking my life. 
That is true. But what is the divine response? You can read this in 1 Kings 18 and 19. What did God say? This is what God said. Everybody read. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Guys, do you know what that means? God is saying, by my sovereign grace, I have kept for myself, not as for himself, 7,000 men who have not bowed down to Baal. God is not simply saying, I have saved these 7,000 from the sword of Jezebel, from the sword of King Ahab. No, no. God is saying more than that. I did not just protect their lives. I protected their spirituality. I am so thankful to God that God has chosen you, God has chosen me, and God is protecting my spiritual walk with him. Honestly, apart from God, I think I'll be a basket case. I, as I look at my life, I look at all the temptations, I don't think I can survive apart from God's election. Are you happy you were chosen by God? Louder, are you happy? Let's be thankful. God chose you. That's why you are here today. Romans 11, 5 and 6, after God spoke to Elijah, and Paul used Elijah's example, this is what Paul said. Everybody read. In the same way then, there has also come at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. How, what is the meaning of the word remnant? Sa Tagalog, retaso. Retaso pala tayo. God is saying, I will choose a remnant, a part. We are that remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, everybody read, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Can you now understand why I'm so happy, I'm so joyful? I'm humbled that God chose us not because we deserve it, but because of grace. For you to understand the difference between grace, justice, equality, I'd like you to look at the story of Jesus when he gave a parable of the kingdom of God. This is found in Matthew chapter 20. The, are you familiar with the story of the vineyard worker? The landowner decided to hire workers. In the time of Israel, the work begins at what time? Six in the morning. What time does the work end? In the days of Jesus, six o'clock. So the owner went, he looked for workers. You know, there's the place of Tambayan, you know, where you just stand by to, to be available to work. Okay, you come, six. And then the Bible tells us at 9 o'clock, oh, he saw some more people not working. Oh, you come. Come to my vineyard. 5 o'clock. You know, problem. The 12 o'clock, he hired. At 3 o'clock, he hired. But when it was 5 o'clock, one hour to go, he saw some workers. Why are you still here? Come, work, and I'll pay you what is right. But at the 6 o'clock, those people who work at the 6 o'clock, they agreed on a salary. You will work at 6 o'clock in the morning. Pare itong sweldo natin, ha? I want you to example, okay? Their minimum wage, let us say now, 600, okay? Oh, pare, ha? 600 peso, 6 o'clock. Yes, sir! So they work. 5 o'clock. I will pay you depending on what I want to pay you. So they did not discuss salary. How can you discuss salary? 5 o'clock, 5 to 6, 1 hour. Now, this is a problem. By the time the work was over, he told the foreman, start paying the workers, not from the first to the last, from the last to the first. When the last workers were paid, you know how much they were paid? They were paid 600. Wow. Tuwang tuwa yung taga 5 o'clock. Wow. The 3 o'clock, 600 per 9 o'clock, 600 per 6 o'clock in the morning, 600 per in. Aha. That's where they complain. Put yourself if you will be in their shoes. I think we are like the six o'clock worker. Itong sabi niya. This last man have worked only one hour, boss. One hour long. And you have made them equal. You see, their concept of justice is equality. Uh-uh-uh. 
equal. Who have borne, we have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Boss, nahirapan kami. We are so hot. We, we were sweating. But the boss answered to one of their friends, uh, this is the, from the master, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for one denarius, one day salary? Did you not agree? Let's read the next verse. Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is that not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Now tell me, is grace a violation of justice? No. What is justice? I pay you as we agreed upon. You deserve. You see, this idea of equality is really our self-centeredness. We want equal treatment. I'm telling you, God is just. He will give you equal justice for sure. On judgment day, people who have not heard the Bible will be judged fairly. Do you know how we will be judged? Look at the book of Revelation. You will be judged according to your behavior. Fair and square. If you deserve to go to heaven, you go to heaven. God is righteous. There's a problem. The problem is based on justice and based on what you have done. All of us are guilty. That's our problem. And because we are all guilty, we are now thinking we should obligate God to give everybody grace. My friend, you cannot obligate grace. Because grace is grace, not works. If you obligate God to give grace to everybody, then grace is no longer grace. Grace becomes a duty. Now, this doctrine of election is not clearly understood. I want you to know the word election comes from the Greek word egloge. But forget the Greek word. Let me just explain to you. What is meant by chosen? What is meant by elected? Example, 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Everybody read. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia. This is right now in present-day Turkey. It's a big piece of property, Bithynia. Now, everybody read. Who are chosen? That's the word elect. Chosen equal elect. Egloge. Ek. Called out. Loge. Chose. So God chose us according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You see, God the Father is involved. Foreknowledge means what? God chose us. Not just knowing us in advance. Plus doing something in advance. By the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is involved in our election. He sanctifies us. And to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Jesus Christ is the ultimate grace of God to save us from our sin. Wow. May grace and peace be abound. And then look at this verse. To repeat, you are special people. Everybody read. Everybody. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood, a holy nation a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The important word is this. You are a chosen race. You are chosen. Who chose you? God. Did he choose you because you're handsome or you're beautiful? You know, God chose me in spite of knowing everything that I'm going to become. I'm a sinner. When I met Jesus, I was not a saint. I was doing horrible things. Yet God still chose to chose us. Praise God. God knows everything about you. So I am grateful, Lord. I am forever grateful and I am thankful. That's why every day I count my blessing. 
my greatest blessing chosen by the grace of God. Do you know this word, elect, is throughout the Bible, but seldom do people teach it. They are embarrassed to say that you are elected of God, but the Bible is clear. Look at Jesus. What did Jesus say? Everybody read Matthew 24. There will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So he's talking about the worst tribulation. That's what most scholars will say, the coming tribulation. It is not yet here. It is coming. But look at what the Bible says. Until those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect. Those days will be cut short. In short, is it possible for the elect to go through tribulation? Louder. You see, many people are so dogmatic that the rapture will occur before the tribulation. Don't be dogmatic. Look at this verse. Look at the next verse. In Matthew 24, verse 31, he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect. This sounds to me like rapture from the four winds. So my friend, question today is this. When Jesus comes again, will you hear the trumpet? Are you elected to be with him? Will you be saved from what's going on? Friends, be grateful that you are the elect. Either rapture or not rapture, the whole point is this. God, in his time, will save us because we are the elect. Point number two, be grateful because of God's wisdom. You know, God's wisdom, what does it mean? You know, when we say God is all wise, he does not randomly, he, he does not randomly make, make decisions. I love the quotation of Kay Arthur. You know, Kay Arthur is a great woman writer, okay? This is what she said. God is in control. And therefore, in everything, I can give thanks. Not because of the situation, but because of the one who directs and rules over it. You, you know, sometimes it's hard to give thanks. When you're having family problem, when your loved one is sick, in all honesty, how, how, how can you say, Lord, I give thanks? You only give thanks because you know God is in control. You thank him, even though you don't know what's going to be the outcome. You thank him. Look at what Henry Thomas said. You know, I like Henry Thomas. He said, if you believe that God overrules all things for good and only permits apparent evil happenings for good and the achievement of great ends unbeknown to you, then all, everybody read, then all is well. All is well because you believe in the sovereignty of God. Are you having some problems now? Be honest with me. Are you having some struggle? Sometimes you have family problems, financial problems, health problems, career problems. Yes or no? Now, I want you to think through. God is allowing this to happen. What should be my response? You've got to trust Him. Learn to be rested. You know, a grateful person is trusting. He's able to be satisfied with what's happening now because he knows God is in control. But his part is not to be lazy. His part is to do his part. You see, I cannot control what's going to happen to me from the outside. But I control my response. And my response is to trust God, to be thankful, and obey Him. That's my part. Good things, bad things. Yes, I know. But life it's more than the present. You see it? Big picture. Is God in control? Now, he, you need to understand this because he now tells you what's happening to the Jews. It's like bad things are happening. Wow. Why is God allowing this? Let me tell you what's happening. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 7 and 8. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those, who were not, but those who were chosen obtained it. We, are, we obtained righteousness. But Israel did not. You know why? They were choosing righteousness based on good works. They cannot do it. 
and the rest were hardened. What do you mean by God allowed the Jewish people to be hardened? I'm going to explain that. Last, last time I explained that already, I will explain again. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear, but down to this very day, continue, down to this very day, as David says, let their table became a, become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs for, forever. You know what? Let me explain to you the meaning. When David uses the word table, table is a picture of prosperity, feasting. And God is saying, these Jewish people, because of their prosperity, it became a trap. They became so proud. They rejected the word of God. Everything was going so well. Let's read the next verse. Romans 11, 11 and 12. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall. Did they? In other words, is Israel forever finished? Because they stumbled? May it never be. No way. But by their transgression, notice now, something bad, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Wow. To make them jealous. If their transgression is riches to the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Now, I want you now to think like a chart, okay? They stumble as the fall. Are they finished? No. Why? By their transgression, notice now, transgression, something's bad, okay? Jewish people, you did not believe, you were rejected, but by their rejection, salvation has come to whom? Gentiles. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Ah, the Bible is not finished. Then the Gentiles will not be a blessing to make them jealous. If their transgression is riches to the world, their failure is riches to the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? In other words, <clears throat> they did not believe. We became blessed. Now that we are blessed, we are supposed to make them jealous so that they will come to Christ. Why do you think we are the recipient of the gospel now? Chosen, elected. How come the Jews, how come many of them are not believers? How come their heart is so hard? I will show you a chart of how a heart is hardened. Do you want to know how a heart becomes hard? I'm warning you. Let's look at this chart. The progression of a hardened heart. You hear the truth. You have been here, but you reject it. What happens? Before long, you become insensitive to the Word of God. And before long, you begin to justify your sinful behavior. Because you need to justify. You can reconcile your faith with your behavior. Because you are, you are rejecting the Word of God. And then the Bible tells us, eventually, you justify and your heart becomes hard. And that's my prayer. I said, Lord, don't make my heart hard. You know, when, when there is sin in my life, I want to deal with it immediately. I don't harbor sin. When you harbor sin, you begin to have callous. And that callous will make your conscience desensitized. In Tagalog, maman hid ka na. And my friend, that's bad. So, God's wisdom, He allowed all of these bad things to happen. Why? Because God has an amazing plan. You know what is His plan? Look at Romans 11, 13, 14. You know, Paul is saying, I am speaking to you who are Gentiles as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. That's why Paul wrote a lot of the letters to Gentiles. People at Ephesus, Colossae, Corinthian. Okay? I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen. His heart is to get them saved. And in God's wisdom, they will get saved. You know, I look at Romans 11, 15. If the rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? Life from the dead. God is not giving up 
on Israel. But the rejection has brought blessing to the world. But someday, someday, they will accept Jesus. And you know what's going to happen? The whole world will be blessed. It's a figure of speech. Can you imagine if the Jews come to know Jesus? What will happen? The new age would have begun. The Bible tells us what will happen. The lion will lie down with children. Children will play with cobras, with vipers. The fox, the wolves, and the sheep will stay together. There's no more bloodshed. That day is coming when the Jews will come to Christ. My goodness, this is the last one. God's kindness and severity. How in the world do you, can you be grateful for God's kindness and severity? Kindness is easy to understand. Kindness, it's God's predisposition to do good to us. But that goodness, let me explain to you, that goodness has the idea of not being apathetic. The kindness of God is deliberate act to bring sinner to God. Kindness reflects benevolence in action. So God's kindness is action to do something good, but sometimes he will use problems to change us. Severity is God's action out of his justice that if you keep going against God, something will eventually happen which will make it irreparable because of God's severity. Let me read for you the, just a few verses so you will understand the severity of God in action. Okay, we'll just go over quickly. I won't explain too much because he uses two analogy. First, the analogy of the dough. If the dough is holy, used in the temple worship, the rest is holy. That is God's way. And then he uses agriculture. If the root is holy, then the branches are too. Now, for you to understand this, let's keep reading. If some of the branches were broken off, and you, that's you and me, wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So the analogy, remember, the original olive tree is the Israel, the Jewish faith, remember? They were cut off because of unbelief. And you, wild olive, you were implanted. Do you realize that Jewish faith is the foundation of Christianity? And yet many Christians don't study the Old Testament. It's our foundation, the root. Continue, next verse. You will say then branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Correct. They were broken off. Why? Human responsibility. Unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Because of our faith, our trust. Do not be conceited, but fear. For God did not spare the natural branches. He will not spare you also. What in the world is God talking about? Ah, read the next verse. Behold the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. What does that mean? Huh? Can I share with you what it means? The warning for God's people is very obvious. You can never take the grace of God in vain. See, the Jewish people took the grace of God in vain. In their mind, we are chosen people. It doesn't matter how we live. A true Christian will never have that attitude. What do I mean? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul warns the believers. Working together with him, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. You see, you keep hearing the gospel. God loves me. Jesus died for me. But you do nothing about it. You are receiving the grace of God in vain. Don't ever do that. A true Christian will be grateful. A grateful person will never dishonor the person who brought him 
blessing. Ang utang na loob is very real. If you have sacrificed your life for me, I will guarantee you, I will not go back against you. I will not dishonor you. I will forever be grateful to you because I understand what you have done for me. Look at the meaning of grace. In Titus, the Bible tells us, the grace of God has appeared. Notice, it brings salvation, but not just salvation. It instructs us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God does something. Deny ungodliness, worldly desires, and live sensibly, righteously. In other words, the grace of God not just brings salvation. It brings transformation. And look at the last part of this transformation. You look, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. No, do you know this? Christ Jesus is described as what? The great God and Savior. Now, I'll give you a bonus. If such is the grace of God, what should you do? God is warning all of us today, all of you now who are listening to me. We know him who said the Lord will judge his people. You are accountable to God. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Can I tell you what is even more terrifying? To fall out of the hands of the living God. To fall into the hands of the living God, there will be discipline. God will do something to change your life. My friend, I don't want to mess up with God. But many Christians today don't understand grace. To them, grace is licentiousness. Hey, like the Jewish people, I belong to Abraham. We are saved. We are chosen people. Doesn't matter how we live. Uh uh uh. They are broken off. Some Christians have this crazy mindset. I'm a Christian. I have Jesus. Doesn't matter how I live. I remember this girl telling my wife, I will divorce my husband. I will remarry the person. Anyway, God is after my happiness. Totally ignorant of what God wants. You must always ask, what does God want? And wrong answer. God wants me to be happy. Listen to me. God wants you to be happy the right way. Happiness comes from holiness. There is no happiness apart from holiness. Yes, temporal happiness may be. But real happiness, only when you live a life pleasing to God. And that, my friend, is why gratitude means what? You don't take God's grace in vain. The severity and the what? Kindness. And do you know what will happen because of the kindness of God to the Jewish people? I don't like to end, make you sad. Here is the good news. The Bible tells us, I do not want you, to, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Everybody read. A partial hardening has happened to Israel. That partial hardening is real. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And so, everybody read, all Israel will be saved. How will they be saved? I have good news for you. You know how they'll be saved? The Old Testament tells us, the book of Zechariah. The book of Old Testament tells us, everybody read, I will pour out on the house of David, the Israelites, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. The second coming of Jesus. The Bible tells us they will look, they will see Jesus. God will give them a spirit. A spirit of what? Grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him, Jesus. And as one mourns for his and only son. And they will weep bitterly. This is repeated in Revelation chapter 1. As we close, look at Revelation chapter 1. Everybody read, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Let me ask you, who pierced Jesus? The Jew. They crucified him. Remember, they said, crucify him. The moment the Jews will realize Jesus is their Messiah, they will all believe. My friend, do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? Praise God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for this group of men and women who finally understand that your sovereign grace is really 
something we should be grateful for. Lord, I am grateful for how you have chosen us, how you have elected us. I am grateful for your wisdom. I can trust you completely. I now pray for some of our brothers here who have never surrendered their lives to you. They have never really bowed down to you and by faith surrendered their lives and received you as their Lord and Savior. Help us not to be like the Jewish people who are thinking you can be saved by your nationality, who think you can be saved by your race, who think you can be saved by your religion. Lord, thank you for reminding us salvation is individual. We need to make a response. We cannot be saved because of our group, because of proxy. It's all individually chosen, individually we must respond. So Lord, individually, we respond to you. I respond to you, Lord, as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.